Hello, I'm Joel Dunning at the STS 2024, and I'm delighted to be here with Benga Okusanya from Jefferson University, Associate Professor. And uh, it's a real pleasure to have you. Well, thank you so much for having me. And uh, thank you especially, you've literally just come off the stage uh, <laughs> running the show, so, so thank Good you very much. much. And, uh, and we really want to talk to you about a really interesting topic, close to my heart as well, is the fact that uh, thoracic surgeons uh, need to lean in a lot more about the specifics of a chest wall surgery service. Uh, it kind of can be the forgotten child, can't it, of thoracic yeah, surgery. But so. actually, um, your whole ethos is that if you lean in, if you actually group this together and you focus on it, then you can get better care. So perhaps um, if you'd just like to sort of highlight your specialist chest wall service and what's included in that and, and how you set this up. Awesome. Thank you so much. So, you know, I, I became interested in practice surgery when I was a resident. I saw a few cases. I thought it was excellent. And as a junior faculty, I said to myself, you know, what are the things that are out there that I can become expert in and grow practice and I really focused in on pectus and it was actually through pectus and actually through some of your work that I learned about slipping rib syndrome and thoracic outlet syndrome and I started doing all those things sort of individually and I really thought to myself these are related conditions you know we have a lot of hypermobility we have young patients we have patients with benign disease which is very different than a lot of our oncologic practice and I thought it would be really good to think about all these things as a one unified group especially because we work with a lot of the same industry and consultants that we can work together in one group to give the best care. Yeah, and they're a very engaged group, aren't they? Yes, you know, a lot of the time right. they've done their research, That's haven't right. they? They've That's done right. years of slipping rib or pectus and <laughs> yeah. thoracic outlet. Very different to the cancer patients, yeah, isn't very it? Much so, so, so yeah. they come with uh, with printouts. Exactly. Yeah, you know, so, uh, patients have quoted my papers to me yeah. Yeah. when they've come into my clinic to say, "Hey, oh, I read your paper. What do you think yeah, about that?" So they're a very informed group. Yeah. So I guess let's take each one individually. Let's, let's start with slipping rib yes, syndrome. So, <laughs> so yeah, we both uh, see these, and actually, I see quite a few, and, and you do as well. Yeah. So, so out there, if there's somebody there that sees now and and again the odd patient how yeah. would you recommend to a thoracic surgeon there to take that to the next level to set up a proper service to give good care to these these horrible patients who've got terrible pain yeah. and have had that for years yeah i think it's really important for us to actually lead with empathy to understand that these patients are really suffering that you know most the average time to diagnosis for a slipping rib patient is more than two years a lot of times they've already had their gallbladder out they've already had some sort of hiatal hernia surgery before they see you and they can realize that it's their ribs number two i would say educate yourself like we're just getting to the precipice where there's really good material out there, you know, from Adam Hansen, Lisa McMahon, you, you know, some of these other groups where you can really read and learn and become thoughtful about how you're going to approach this condition. And then lastly, I would say build a team of people where you are that are going to help you. I would say find a really good radiologist, maybe someone that does ultrasound, dynamic ultrasound and injections. Find a good physiatrist, a PM&R doctor, and find a good pain management doctor. And all of you work together to talk about how are we going to approach these patients, what are our modalities going to be, and then obviously go and learn the surgery from someone who really knows how to do it so you can offer the best techniques. Yeah, and you, you follow quite a good pathway. So, <laughs> so you've got an assessment, you do your tests, your dynamic ultrasound, and yep. then you, you start with your pain management, then your intracostal injections, yep. and then at the end of that, uh, you've got your, your surgical options. That's right. And uh, so, so and that looks like really sensible. And then just tell us about the sort of surgery that you offer for these patients with slipping rib. Yeah, so you know, I'm a bit of an uh, Adam Hansen disciple myself, so I really do like the 3.0 surgery that he offers. You know, the 3.0 you know, talks a lot about the cartilage excision, using a spacer and then using the bioabsorbable plate on top. I've found that since I've transitioned to that, patients actually have a lot less pain, especially in that early post-operative period. By four weeks, people are like, I feel good. Whereas I felt like some of the traditional techniques, it was really like six to eight weeks, people felt good. And then also having them already in with pain management and also in with PM&R allows us to transition them back off their medicines and then also get them into physical therapy and rehab, which is really the long-term fix to this problem. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's certainly the thing I've learned is that the long term fix is building the muscles up because yep. it's, it's wasting those muscles is, is the is the doom spiral, that's isn't right. it? Exactly. Where where it gets weaker and more more ribs jangle. Yes. And uh, and yeah, and I, I totally agree with you that that the early days of, of stitching the ribs together crushed nerves quite a lot, didn't yes, it? And I actually agree. that spacing them out and holding your ribs still is, is, is a good solution, really, yes. isn't it? So and and, uh, and and I guess if you if you had to have any tips for somebody trying to start slipping ribs, 
it's uh, you know because it's quite difficult to learn how to do the operations, isn't yeah. it? Really, because because yeah. you learn from experience a year later <laughs> when they still got pain, don't you? Yeah, so very much so. so the thing is, you, you know, it is very small in numbers, mm -hmm. isn't it? So how yeah. how would someone learn? Yeah, say? I think certainly. Um, Actually, if you can take the time to go visit Adam Hansen down in West Virginia, he's very pro people coming down to Great. see clinic patients and see an operation. You know, if you want to visit Lisa McMahon out in uh, Phoenix Children's, you can do that. And then, you know, lean on your other experience. One of the unique things that we have as thoracic surgeons is that we work with the chest wall and the chest cage all the time. It is a matter of routine. You're not afraid of getting into pleura. It's not that big a yeah. deal, yeah, <laughs> right? Sure. Yeah. And then you understand already when you think about the ribs, about their shape, about their orientation and about their function. I think once you take that experience and couple it with a little bit of, a, you know, either watching videos and calling people and talking to them and understanding what the challenges are, then you can feel like you can provide something that's worthwhile. Yeah, great. And, and I've managed to talk to Adam Hansen and things. He even talked about these things, intercondral joints That's now right. as well. That's right. So yeah, I mean, <laughs> yes. tell our audience about, uh, yeah. so, so basically the, I didn't even know about these until a couple yeah. of years ago. So, you know, sometimes yeah. we'll have patients who, you know, I think this is the other thing about slipping rib. There are a number of associated conditions that you sort of have to learn about. It's kind of like thoracic outlet and learning about pec minor syndrome. You know, so there are these little intercostal um, joints that can go down between the fifth and sixth ribs that are very anterior. So even if you fix someone sort of more anterior lateral rib pain, they can still complain of this chest pain right here that you can oftentimes see a fracture on a CAT scan or an MRI. And then there's the other, you know, lower floating rib diseases like 11th rib tip, rib tip L1 syndrome, and uh, 12th rib tip syndrome or intercostal costoiliac impingement syndrome. So there are all these other things that sort of come with the disease that you have to be aware of and learn about so you make sure you give maximal options for your patients. Yeah, so yeah. suddenly the iceberg's looking a bit bigger, <laughs> isn't it, under the yeah, water? Yeah, but so, uh, but yeah, so right. The, the yeah. more you do, the more you discover yeah. about these extra things because patients come back still sore lower or upper, upper higher, exactly. don't you? But that's yeah. great. So let's move on perhaps to, to pectus surgery. Yes. And, uh, and, and tell us about how you built your practice Practice in pectus surgery and, and, and what you offer as a chest wall service. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, pectus, I, I've always found to be just a fascinating procedure. I think it's one of the, the most satisfying operations for a surgeon to do, to have a very obvious defect and to leave the operating room with that fix and having a decompressed heart. It's wonderful. So for me, I really took an approach where I said I was going to go to the course, which is a wonderful course. It's offered out in Arizona. I took a lot of notes and then I went back and actually worked with a senior partner of mine when I was still in Pittsburgh and I scrubbed with her and I learned those cases from her and I learned her techniques. So I felt really comfortable that I had the ability to do these cases on my own. Mm -hmm. I think what was really great is that the hospital had great buy-in, my, my chair, my chief had really great buy-in. And then I did a bunch of cases and I actually went back to the course and I went back and I walked, watched Dr. Jarajewski operate and Dr. McMahon operate. And that really solidifies your understanding because there's some things you can't appreciate unless you've done it. So it was really nice to go back afterwards and sort of close the loop on my experience. Yeah. 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 And and strangely, it's, it's got this analogies with sleeping rib because the more you do, the more you find difficult cases That's or strange right. cases <laughs> or really stiff older yeah. people right. and things. So, yeah. so as you've developed, have you worked out mechanisms for the older stiffer chest yeah, and things? Know, so now I am, I am hyper vigilant now about the patient with the stiff chest. So I really look at the calcification of those costal junctions to really understand, do I think this is someone that's going to lift. I'm unafraid now to do a little um, uh, partial osteotomy in the front to make sure that you get good release and good lift. These are all subtleties that are hard to appreciate when you do it because it's not like the same version of the pediatric operation where you pass a bar and they lift up and they flip and it's perfect. It's They're so like lucky that, that <laughs> aren't they? It kills me. Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So it's a much more challenging, much more a thoughtful, really truly orthopedic operation in the older adult patient. So you have to have some level of comfort with sternal plating, rib plating, all these different manipulations that you might need to do to get a good outcome. Yeah, and yeah. we were talking earlier that things like the hammock stitch is yeah. absolutely vital. Perfect. You know, you, you you can't allow a bar to strip those intercostal spaces. And then yeah. that comes from experience, doesn't yeah, it? That's exactly hopefully right. either painful yeah. person experience or hopefully <laughs> oh, learning from others, exactly, which is always right. nicer. But yeah. yeah, so so again, that's that's your two out of three where the more you do, the more you learn, more isn't you it really? Exactly so right. yeah. let's move to this third condition that you've put together yeah. uh, and it's thoracic outlet syndrome, sort yeah. of three in one, the isn't it really? Exactly, so yeah, tell yeah. us about the service you offer for, for that. Yeah, so, you know, for thoracic outlet syndrome, you know, the majority of thoracic outlet syndrome is neurogenic thoracic outlet. And they can be a little bit of an orphan condition because our vascular surgeons are obviously very interested in the arterial and the venous version, but there's not a lot of people out there who are willing to take on the challenge of neurogenic thoracic outlet syndrome. So we do robotic, uh, robotic assisted first rib resections from the inside, which I find to be a very 
lovely and elegant operation because of the fact that I don't have to manipulate like the phrenic nerve and grab the artery and do all these other things on the inside. Yeah, yeah. And our patients have really great outcomes. And again, same way, I partner with physiatry. I partner with my diagnostic uh, colleagues to do scaling blocks preoperatively to tell us about their outcomes. We measure their function of their hand. I use the uh, a uh, validated metric to see how their arm feels before and after. And we have had really good outcomes with yeah. first rib resection. And do you, do you have an endoscopic burr to cut the, yes, the rib? What yes, do you yes, got? Yes, yeah. yes. We use the Midas yeah. Rex. It's, a, yeah. it's near to my heart. And yeah. for that procedure also, I actually went down to Baylor and I learned from Brian Burt, you know, who in North America is no question the expert. So these are all different things where I travel with different people to learn different skills. Yeah. Yeah, and, and do, you, do you think the nerve sometimes gets like adhesions on it and you have to unpick that as well? Absolutely. So that nerve? Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. You can really feel it when you see someone that's tight and then you take that rib out and you feel all the contents decompress and people wake up and they're like, you know, granted I have rib chest pain yeah. <laughs> from the surgery, yeah. but certainly that their arm pain does improve. And I think that's an operation where you can feel very confident that you're going to be able to help someone. Yeah. yeah, and actually, if you do it methodologically, it's not dangerous, isn't it? No, you know, I think not. I think people young in their experience are thinking, "Oh my God, the yeah. subclavian artery," but yeah. it pills away yeah. very it, safe. Yeah, I find it to be personally much safer than yeah. like you, what you see. The I think the skill gap is actually much narrower for a, for a robotic approach than it is for an open approach. I think an expert open approach is great, but you have to be really good at that operation to do it safely. Yeah. And I think that the what you have to be really good at is actually not as onerous if you do it from the chest. Yeah. yeah. So, so there's your three in one. You've got That's slipping right. rim, we'll pectus, and, uh, yeah. and and thoracic outlet. And do you, do you have a specific clinic for this? How does it work then? Yeah. And how would you recommend people set up their chest wall service? Yeah, I think it's all about collaboration. It's all about finding the people in your institution who care, who actually would really like to do a little bit of research and really like to advance the field. And we loop them all in together. We built a dedicated website, we built dedicated yeah. videos, and we have a landing place for the patients to say, I have these problems, how can I get together in one place to get them solved? And the other thing that I think also marries these conditions is the idea of hypermobility, right? Some that are diagnosed and some that are not. And having an awareness of those conditions, understanding that there are gonna be more challenges with the cartilage, understanding the other problems that these patients have really allows you to give the best overall care. Yeah, absolutely. So do you have a geneticist to look at the Ellers Danlos sort yes, of? We have people that we work with that can bring it all together. And that way yes, we really yes. make sure we cover all our bases. Yeah, I'm so jealous. Yeah, <laughs> I, 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 wanna, but, yeah I looked at your website and it's absolutely yeah. amazing. We'll try and put a link uh, yeah. to this video because it's a really great example of, uh, of a nice unified care, which it brings so much to the practice. And it, it just diversifies your practice, doesn't absolutely. it? It's a really nice absolutely. thing. And I think, you know, it's really important for these patients because a lot of them just suffer. You know, I see 20, 30 year olds who have howlers of five and a half and they're like, oh, I can't run anymore. I can't lift my kid up. And you're like, well, maybe it's your pectus, <laughs> you know, and like it's not until they see someone like us who's trained and cared that they can get the care they need. Same thing for slipping ribs, same thing for TOS. And, and I, the final thing I just, I liked on your website, you have LinkedIn clinical trials, you mm -hmm. know, so you're pushing the boundaries, looking into to what you can do research-wise. Maybe tell us a little bit about uh, how, how you're using clinical trials as well. Yeah, so, so you know, there's still a lot that's unknown, you know, especially in slipping rib. It's a disease where there's maybe 500 people in the, on the medical side that actually know anything about the condition. So we really have to build those into our clinical practices. We have a commitment as early stage, you know, sort of discoverers to make sure that we get as much good data. And, you know, Adam and Lisa have already led the way for us. So it's really important for us to continue to contribute to the science. So we've been building trials. We're having to ask important questions like, who is actually gonna do the best with slip and rib repair? Because it's one of our biggest challenges to know. You know, we quote people a 15 to 20% failure rate and it would be really great for us to figure out who that is so maybe we can get them a more optimal therapy than surgery. Yeah, absolutely. Well, absolutely fantastic. Uh, it's been a real pleasure talking to you awesome. and uh, what a wonderful service you've set up. And I think it's a, it's a real example to us all. So thank, thank you, you so, so much. much. Appreciate you. Yeah, great, great talk. Cheers. <laughs> Thanks a lot.